what's up today i'm going to talk about my fork of the pojav launcher that plays runescape the pojav launcher is a launcher for the minecraft java edition the desktop version of the game for android and ios so it implements the java virtual machine all right it occurred to me that people might actually want to see what the app does because there's a uh, not a lot of people that have probably used it before uh so this is just going to be me demoing what it can do. So we have the mouse cursor, uh, you can tap on the mouse button and then you get touch input. Um, we have, like on remote desktop, if you've ever used that before, you use one thumb as like a trackpad, and then the other thumb you can use to right click. And then if you want to just left click, you just tap one time. Uh, here, we'll switch the song just to show that it works. We'll home teleport, so we'll attack uh, this man here. Uh, we have a camera control button. This is uh, emulating a middle mouse press, basically. So you can just drag the camera around. We have a uh, keyboard, goes and works fine. Inside of this video, I'm only going to talk about the Android side of that, though. The iOS version, you could probably make something like this for that, but uh, it requires libhooker, which is a jailbreak exclusive, so you need root. This will run just fine on uh, any Android phone, though. The Pojab launcher comes with OpenJDK 1.8. It's uh, not that uncommon to have JVMs on Android. You can get one in Termux or other ways as well, but... The cool thing is that this is a head full kind of uh, implementation that lets you actually have a mouse and keyboard input. So the way that Pojab is set up is that they're using LWJGL to get the OpenGL and OpenAL bindings for Minecraft. But they also have a mod installer connected to it, which is for installing Minecraft mods like Optifine, uh, which emulates a headful environment without X11 uh, using something called Cacciavallo. Cacchio, Cacchio um, it's a library made by Oracle, I think, used to test GUI applications without a head, so you could have this on your uh, continuous integration server or whatever to, to run tests to make sure that UI elements are launching properly but it's perfect for our uses here because we're just using the Cacchio Cavallo outputs as our X11 server, basically. We're just using it as a display. Because it's headless, um, bindings for things like audio and X11, so also X11 display server stuff, is not going to work properly. So this allows Swing apps to open and the and the RS client is a Swing app, so this works perfectly for us. I did have to strip out a x86-64 pre-compiled lib that was in the client before. So currently we have only ARM compatible code. So mouse input, uh, this was the first issue that I had to overcome. It's not that crazy of a thing to, to get over, so I just followed this oracle doc on how to do a mouse event listener so using that as our demo i was able to see that the mouse was working i just didn't have it hooked properly in my client i wasn't able to activate any clicks uh, but what i found is that i needed to add additional mouse listeners to the j frames and canvas components to make sure that they were actively listening uh, I probably went a little overkill. I have that. Uh, we have additional mouse listeners here. You can see I just kind of spam them all over the place. They're here. They're in some other places. Anywhere that you have uh, mouse input, make sure that you have a mouse listener or else it's not going to hook properly. Even though it works fine on desktop without all of these additional listeners, I think that it's a quirk of the Cacchio Cavallo to not properly be able to uh, to handle it. So once I had mouse input done, next you need a keyboard um, to make sure that you can type in your username and password. So I have a uh, keyboard event. So the Android spec, Android keyboard, Android key down. So what we'll learn here 
is that as soft input methods can use multiple and inventive ways of inputting text, there is no guarantee that any key press on a soft keyboard will generate a key event. There are some keyboards that this works with, some that don't, but the nice thing about Android is that you can just install another keyboard. I'm using SwiftKey uh, so that Microsoft can collect all my data but Gboard works for most of its keys and the One UI 3.0 and One UI 3.1 Samsung default keyboards also work. I just recommend people that are using it to download SwiftKey if it doesn't work properly for them because there's a lot of different keyboard implementations across Android that don't dispatch key events and that's how we're hooking the, uh, the state here. So keys are sent to the client using this AWT input bridge. It sends the scan code over to the VM, uh, the JVM. But I was having difficulty with special characters, just caps or uh, shift to be specific. Uh, I couldn't get it to do a key up event. It would just send the shift and then it would be permanently shifted. So to avoid that, I just created a single digit caps lock. I sacrificed one of the keys, uh, scan code 123, which is F12. Uh, not useful in the game, so just whatever key is free. This could have been like page up, page down, whatever key was not in use. Uh, so I have the client listen for scan code 123. And if it gets that, it will read that first as a shift modifier. And then the next key that it gets will be uh, converted to a capital or a special character depending on uh, what character you put in. So I have some pretty nasty stuff here like get special here, uh, switch case for the input. So these are all of the special keys that you could do. Like if you do F12 and one, you'll get the same thing as shift in one, which is the exclamation mark. There's no built-in library for this. There's probably a cleaner way to do it, but this is like a 20 case switch statement. It doesn't really matter. Uh, so we're reading in the key press. These are all of the events that are coming in. Uh, just some debug here. And then I have the client listen for a couple other special modifier keys. So uh, I have one for zooming in and out the camera, just any any kind of information that I want to send from the POJAV client into the JVM. I have hooked into special uh, one of the F keys or whatever, just a key that's not in use and then uh, rebinding its function. Down here for capitalized, meaning the most recent key press was uh, F12. Then we reset capitalization to off. Re we replace the key code with uh, the get special version of it. Uh, if it is a special character, if it's not, then we just do to uppercase and uh, print that out. I know that this code is basically legible. The point is uh, this client is fully obfuscated basically still. Uh, functions like this are, are a problem. I spent at least a couple hours de-obfuscating the audio code, which I'll get into later, but uh, this sort of stuff I'm going to probably clean up um, so that people that come to it in the future will actually understand what's going on. The Android side of things is much cleaner than the client side of things. So that's the keyboard inputs. Um, now I'm going to talk about the sound. I just did this yesterday, which kind of buttoned up the project for me. Uh, there's no sound devices emulated inside of the JVM, which is not a surprise because it's a headless environment. Uh, but I was assuming that if I just hooked the Javex sound, that I'd still be able to get it. But the Javex sound actually fails to even initialize. Um, what my original plan was, like I wanted to get the audio stream from the client and then just pipe it into OpenAL, which is an audio library that is not built in, but it's made into LWJGL, which is auto loaded in the JVM. So I thought that I'd be able to just hook this audio stream. So here's how it works on desktop. You just have the client using javx.sound to output to the speakers. It wants to output to a source data line, but source data line is part of this javex.sound.sampled. Uh, and because of that, we are unable to even initialize this, which makes the audio fail on POJAV. The idea was that I'd have 
this come off here and have OpenAL, and then OpenAL could uh, could play to the Android speaker because this here would not exist. We'd just pipe the data from this javx.sound into OpenAL and then it would play it a second time. And that second time would be the only time on Android because the speakers don't exist. Here's me just explaining that same thing here. I don't think I'd tested it at this point, but you know, it worked. You'll hear it. Hear the buzzing? Anyway, to even make it do that probably took me at least 14 hours. Yeah, so a bit of a bummer on there, but no big deal. So I abandoned the OpenAL implementation and I instead dumped all of the sounds to OGG and just read them locally. So the client sends a message back to Android, then Android will just load the file itself instead of having the JVM manage that. So we have it, some, some things are messaging to the client, and then this is a client message to the Android app to actually just play the sound using Android Media Player. You can see that here, uh, we just have the, the log going and if it, contains a message, which could be, you know, whatever flag, this probably is not a great flag, goes to the message handler, uh, we handle the message, we split it into different commands, new, new music, we go to the J sound audio manager, we play sounds to the service, sound service, which has a music player and a sound effects player, their states are manipulated with those commands, it was important to use media player instead of async media player because async media player you can't you can't change the volume of an async player um async player i don't know why it it's probably just missing the, the proper implementation for it but there's multiple ways for you to change the sound of things in android you can hook the entire system sound and turn it up or down like you could unsilent a phone, which is the reason why you don't want to do it this way, or you don't want to do it using these system-wide hooks, is because if the phone is on silent or at a certain volume or whatever, you can change the volume, but that's going to go against what the user actually wanted. So this way we're actually just changing the, the media player's source sound instead of the system-wide audio. So what are some finishing touches that I need to do to make this all that it can be? Well, right now, uh, because I dumped all of the assets to OGG, I'm reconverting them with VLC just to get a little bit of compression on them. We're, we're going from OGG to OGG, but I think that whatever encoded them originally uh, added some junk to it. Like that the re-encode should still be lossless because I'm not changing the bitrate, I'm not changing the samples, I'm not changing any of that. I'm just taking the file, re-encoding it into another OGG, which should be lossless, right? Uh, if I'm using Vorbis. That's what I'm doing right now. I have, these are all of the songs. It ballooned the file size a lot to have all of the sound effects, or have all of the music dump. The sound effects are not that big. If we go here to the sound effects, so uh, 181 megabytes for all of the sound effects, uh, but all of the music is closer to a gig in a little bit, like uh, 1.15 gigs. Any amount that I can shave off the file size, not that it really matters that people are downloading a one gigabyte app, like is that really that crazy? No. But why make them download a one gigabyte app if it can be, you know, 700 megabytes? And originally it was only 90 megabytes, so it does feel a little gross to go from 90 to 700 just because you aren't reading the files from the cache. That's what somebody with a big, big brain would do. They would, uh, they would port the playback functionality from the client into Android and just play the sounds uh, from the cache, but 
hey, I'm I'm not that smart. We're just going to dump the OGGs and play them with the media player, okay? So yeah, I think that that might have been helpful to one person in the world if they're hoping to use the uh, Pojav Launcher's source code to re-implement some kind of graphical swing app on Android. You know, whoever that is, probably another person making a RuneScape client or something similar. It can be done. Uh, there's not a lot of documentation out there for even the existence of this kind of graphical open JDK for Android, which I think it would probably be useful to other people trying to port legacy apps over to Android, just in a really quick and dirty way. Uh, this was much, 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 much easier than, you know, trying to get all of this to render uh, natively on Android, although it is, you know, more or less native. So we have, uh, so that's that, guys. Thanks for 5,100 uh, subscribers. Pretty cool, guys.